hey, use code Bengal at sign up on FanDuel. You get a free $20 to play with. Also, check out my links down in the description for Twitter, Twitch, second and third channels for all different types of content that you might enjoy. So be sure to check it out and let's get into the video. What's going on guys, Bengal again here coming back at you with another video and today doing another off-season preview per usual if you like what you see or uh, even if you don't, just hit the subscribe button for more videos. That would be fantastic. Per usual, people are going to agree, people are going to disagree. Each move is contingent upon the next one. So if I do something in free agency, it directly affects what we're going to be doing in the draft. I hope to some degree it gives you guys kind of a... Uh, a guideline or a little bit of a map to what these teams might actually do. And today on the docket, as you can tell from the title and the thumbnail and the graphics, we are doing the Tampa Bay Buccaneers who have recently acquired a new head coach in Bruce Arians, the potential quarterback whisperer. He has been fantastic in the past and could potentially turn around the Tampa Bay Buccaneers who have struggled so mightily in recent years. Is Jameis Winston the answer at quarterback? Do they need to go a different route? Let's find out. We're going to start out by making some re-signing, some players that I think are really important to the success of the team long-term, uh, and in some cases, maybe not so much long-term, but players that need to be signed right away uh, as both depth and important players. Uh, to potentially come in and start good, meaningful backups in some cases. Donovan Smith is an offensive tackle that can start right away on that left side. He has been. He's only 26 years old. Still a lot of room to improve, and this doesn't mean they don't go out and get an offensive tackle, but I don't think it's their top priority. I know a lot of guys have mocked Jonah Williams to the Bucks uh, at number five, but I'm not really sure that happens because you have Donovan Smith, and this isn't a super talented offensive line class near the top in my opinion so I'm not really sure you need to go out and get Jonah Williams early because your offensive line at least at tackle uh, is it's solid at least because if you bring back Donovan Smith which I guess they don't have to but I think it'd be probably a pretty good move too is a guy that probably and I, guess, I do say probably because these things aren't set in stone uh, but he probably won't be too expensive you can bring him back on, on a deal, maybe maybe three to six million per year over like four years or so. Probably wouldn't be too bad. And then DeMar Dotson on the other side is a really, really solid right tackle. The only problem with him is he is 33, going to be 34 years old next season. So that brings up some challenges, in my opinion, because uh, how long does he have left? I think that's an important question. And even though DeMar Dotson's solid now, do you go out and get a tackle early to potentially replace him? It's possible, but we're bringing back Donovan Smith. Cairo Santos actually provided some stability at the kicker position for the Bucks that they haven't really seen in a while. And of course, the biggest re-signing is Quan Alexander, a player that, in my opinion, you absolutely have to bring back and you don't think twice about it. Quan Alexander is only 24 years old. He's been easily your second best linebacker it is tough to outplay Levante David but boy has Quan Alexander been solid when he's on a good cover linebacker that can go out and make tackles all over the field when he's healthy he is a beast in 2016 just at 22 years of age had 145 combined tackles when he played all 16 games but that has been the question he's only played 16 games once 12 games his rookie season 12 games his third season in 2017, and then last year played only six, but he is worthy of a new contract for sure. He has been a very, very solid player for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, in my opinion. And then their last re-signing is, of course, going to be JV and Elliott, a name that probably is going to fly under the radar for most of you guys. But he was a player I think that was pretty good for the Bucs. They used him in a variety of different roles, and he's someone that really came on near the end of the season and provided some stability at cornerback for the Tampa Bay Bucs. So, I wouldn't mind keeping him at all. We're also going to cut Deshaun Jackson. And I I did this maybe a week ago. I thought this was probably a pretty good move. And then Deshaun Jackson went and posted something on Twitter or his Instagram story, or I'm not even sure what, that said, like, it was something about uh, leaving people behind or whatever. Maybe he's talking about the Bucks, But I think he's going to get cut, honestly. It's zero dead cap for the Bucks if they do it by the deadline um, or past the deadline, whatever it happens to be. And they save... 
10 plus million. This is a no-brainer for me. Deshaun Jackson is an older player that has produced, but his main ability is being a deep threat. And now, as someone that has just turned 32 years old, I don't, I don't think there's any reason to hold on to him. You have other solid receivers uh, that more than make up for, for what, uh, what uh, Deshaun Jackson brought to the table. We're going to re-sign Adam Humphreys, so, I mean, it's no big deal at all. We cut Deshaun Jackson, save a bunch of cap. I'm not ready to cut Gerald McCoy. I can't do that. I know it, it's not a lot of dead cap, uh, if any, for the Bucks, but I, I just can't do it. I can't cut Gerald McCoy. In free agency, we are really going all out. We're going to target a number of really, really talented players, but some of these players have, you know, concerns, let's say, as you can see. Uh, Jason Verrett's on the screen and say what you will about Jason Verrett and I know what most people will say this is a guy that cannot stay on the field in four years in the NFL he's played in just 25 games including five over the last two years only six games his rookie year the most games he's ever played in a season was 14 here's the thing though Jason Verrett is a young player he is 27 years old and when he's been on the field Jason Verrett has been unbelievably good. One of the top cornerbacks in the NFL. Certainly has been. Certainly has been. But the injuries are such a concern. Such a concern. So, I think Jason Verrett is going to be a rather cheap free agent to bring in. Because you're going to be taking a chance on him. The Bucks are so weak at the cornerback position. We're not bringing back Brent Garimes. We're cleaning up and clearing out a lot of cap space. This is going to be, give us room to make a bunch of moves. If they cut Gerald McCoy, I mean, even more over that. But you're going to have the money to sign Jason Verrett. This is a player that probably won't cost more than 6 mil per year at the most, and he's going to offer a lot more value than that if he manages to stay healthy. Next up, we're going to be bringing in Andy Levitre, a solid offensive guard, another guy that will be kind of middle of the market in terms of how expensive they are, you know, along with other offensive guards in the league. Probably a guy you can bring in for maybe uh, five to six to seven or eight annually. He might get a little bit more expensive there. We're going to try to keep it down. And I know what a lot of Bucks fans are going to be thinking. Hey, how can you afford to do all of this under the salary cap? The Deshaun Jackson move makes all of this possible because it saves so much money. Because you go from 12 to 22, you already have a lot of pieces in place with uh, how controllable your players are. And I, when I say that, I mean years left on their salary. So you don't actually have to go out and bring in a bunch of filler pieces and waste a lot of cap room. So even though we're taking off some of that with Jason Verrett, talking between you know 4 to $8 million maybe there, take some off. Andy Levitre probably, or Andy Levitre, excuse me, probably about the same. You still have some more money there. The reason I really think we can afford to make some of these moves if we're the Tampa Bay Buccaneers is because even though in 2019 you don't have a ton of salary cap, of course it gets extended with guys like Deshaun Jackson. Well, in 2020, it's going to jump to almost $70 million in unallocated funds in a just straight cap room. So that's going to just free up so many moves to be made. So we're going to cut it really tight this year. And then we're not going to have any problems for the rest. It's just going to be a little bit tight this year and then fine for the rest. Levitri makes a lot of sense on the offensive line. Sure up that offensive guard spot on that left side or on that right side. We have Ali Marpet at left guard, but right guard has been a problem. So Levitri can come in and, um, you know, two or three year deal really help out this team. And the last signing is probably going to be the most expensive one. This will probably bring the Bucks down to about uh, seven or eight million in cap space which is uh, on the lower side of the entire NFL but I think it's worth it you see it you see teams like the Vikings that had 6.6 .6 mil in cap space the Jaguars three and a half the Eagles in really really bad spot as well but we're gonna get down there pretty much as low as we can overall they're gonna be more signings than just this I try to keep it with three uh, for these videos though but haha -ha Clinton Dix is not gonna be a cheap player this is probably going to be in the 8 to 12 million range per year, and that's going to bring us down to probably 
uh, with the Deshaun Jackson move and the rest of the moves to about six or seven mil in in cap space, depending on what these contracts give, which would be still about what the Vikings had this past year. So this is doable for teams. This would be cutting it close, though, but I think safety is a position that the Buccaneers probably will target. Haha, ha, Clinton Dix makes a ton of sense. Of course, the Redskins traded for him from the Packers, and now he is an unrestricted free agent at the end of the year. Redskins could franchise tag him. All these guys could be tagged or, or re-extended by their teams. But we're going to play under the mindset that these guys are testing free agency. Haha, ha, Clinton Dix, if he tests the open market, would make a fantastic addition to the Bucks secondary at strong safety. We have Justin Evans at free safety. If he stays healthy and progresses, he's going to be a fine starter. Need a more traditional strong safety, and I think that's exactly what Haha ha Clinton Dix can bring to the table. Now on to the draft. As I hinted at earlier, I am not having the Bucks take an offensive lineman. If Jonah Williams would have been taken at five, potentially moved to guard, that would make sense at, at, a, at right guard or a potential starter at tackle. Down the line, depending on what happens with DeMar Dotson or if Donovan Smith isn't extended. But of course, in this scenario, Donovan Smith is extended. We do go out. We do sign a right guard, Andy Levitri. We need to address a different position, and that is cornerback. Greedy Williams is arguably the best cornerback in the draft. I could see him going at number five. I don't think it's out of the question at all. He is going to be an impact playmaker in the secondary and really help out that Bucks cornerback group that has been lacking so heavily over the past couple of years. Round two, Dalton Risner. Have him listed at offensive tackle here, but realistically, he's a guy that can work all over the offensive line. This, in my mind, is better value than Jonah Williams at number five. This is a guy that can play right guard, like Jonah Williams can. Center, if need be, but you have Ryan Jensen, so that's not really too big of a deal. Could play left guard if Ali Marpet goes down. Could play left tackle. Could play right tackle. This is a guy that can really move all over the offensive line. Center's a bit of a stretch, but I think both guard spots and both tackle spots. He's a versatile player that will either start at right guard right away or eventually be groomed into that starting tackle role. This is fantastic value at the start of the second. Round three, an interesting player. I know a lot of people don't think that Brian Burns is going to fall all the way to the third round, but there is a lot of potential for it. He is certainly light for the position. And uh, he does have a number of flaws, even though his production has been pretty good. And he does, uh, he does impress you with his athleticism at times. However, I think Brian Burns very well could be available at the top of the third round. I think we've seen better players fall further. You look at Justin Reed, who went to the Texans in the third round this past year that probably shouldn't have escaped the first round. So Brian Burns, a fringe, very, very fringe at the end of the first round player. Second round guy, most likely. Could very well fall the the uh, start of the third round. And the Bucks, who need edge pressure help so desperately, go with an edge rusher here that can can rotate in and uh, help out immediately. Of course, they do have decent starters, but they, they need rotational help a lot. And Brian Burns, I think, fills that need very, very well. Round four, we're going Elijah Holyfield out of Georgia. It was really tough for me because I wanted the Bucks to go out and get a running back. And I think they could go one at some point in the draft. I just think that Ronald Jones had a rough rookie season. That's what it comes down to. He's a second-round pick that really could not find it at all this rookie season. And I think part of that is the offensive scheme. That's going to change with Bruce Arians coming in. I'm, I'm ready to give him another shot. I think it's worth it. It's a second-round pick. You got to at least try. Rojo was good at USC. He's worthy of at least a second chance for the second round pick in his second year. A lot of twos there. And Isaiah Holyfield, or excuse me, Elijah Holyfield could be just that. A number two running back behind Ronald Jones if things work out. Maybe he's a guy that can, can get reps at number one. I don't think Peyton Barber is your every down running back. So with Elijah Holyfield, with Ronald Jones hopefully progressing, I think it becomes a much better backfield. You're just, in this scenario counting on the progression of Ronald Jones to to amp up and improve because what he offered you his rookie season was quite frankly not good enough. Round five, we are going Andy Isabella, wide receiver out of UMass. This is a weird player for me, man. I think he could go in the second round. I think he could go in the third, fourth, fifth, maybe even the sixth. It just, it depends on so many different things. I think he's a guy that's actually going to test pretty well. He's not your typical slot guy that's like, you know, 4-5-5, four, 4-6, five, five, four, six, four, six, speed. That's just a good route runner. 
with decent hands, like a Cole Beasley. Cole Beasley actually ran pretty fast at SMU uh, a number of years ago. But Andy Isabella is a guy that's probably going to run pretty fast. He's only 5'10". He led the nation in receiving yards this past year, which doesn't mean a whole lot to me. He played at UMass. He was their number one weapon. Some of those yards came in garbage time. I know they played Georgia, and it was the fourth quarter. He had like 120 yards in the fourth quarter, something ridiculous, two touchdowns against you know freshman players at Georgia that never would have seen the field otherwise, and they were kind of exposed. He's a good route runner with, I don't even want to say deceptive speed. I don't want to say, oh, he's a hard worker. He's hard, gritty, tough nose. He's He'll outwork anybody. No. Like, he's actually, I think, a pretty fast player. Good route runner. Good hands. Someone that has way better value than the fifth round. But if he drops here, if he's available, I think the Bucks have to pull the trigger. Could be your Deshaun Jackson replacement. This is a really, really high ceiling player. Round six, we're getting offensive line help as far as depth goes. That's going to be Zach Bailey, an offensive guard out of South Carolina. Injuries happen. You need backup offensive linemen. Zach Bailey is going to fit the bill here in the sixth round. And then round seven, wrapping this seven-round mock up, we're going Jake Browning, quarterback out of Washington. Backup quarterback, every team needs one. Jake Browning to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers with their last pick in the draft. Now to the offensive side of the ball. This is what the new-look team will hopefully be, which is Chris Godwin, Adam Humphreys in the slot. Also get Andy Isabella some reps there. Mike Evans at that wide receiver on the far right. And then the offensive line, you got Donovan Smith re-signed. Ali Marpet, Ryan Jensen hopefully having a better season this year. Yet the introduction of Andy Levitri at right guard and DeMar Dotson making this offensive line very, very solid. Of course, O.J. Howard comes back healthy. You also have Cameron Brait off the bench. He's a noteworthy name. And then the backfield of Jameis Winston. You got Ronald Jones is going to be the projected starter for me right now. I, I wouldn't start Ronald Jones, but... That's what we're going to have in this one. Uh, wouldn't start Elijah Holyfield either. This is a job that someone's going to have to go out and win, and it could be Ronald Jones. This is the new-look offense. Honestly, not a whole lot of changes here. This was a pretty good team. In, in terms of uh, offensive players, they got hurt by injury a lot. O.J. Howard looked like a monster before injury. And uh, this is a team that, with a new offensive coordinator, with a new head coach, could be a very, very dangerous offense. Bruce Arians is no joke immediately one of the best head coaches in the NFL now that he's back. And then on the defensive side of the ball, obviously a lot of changes here. Uh, we got Justin Evans at free safety. Ha Ha Clinton Dix at strong safety. You got Jason Verrett and Greedy Williams at those cornerback spots. And then the linebacking core. Looks like there are a lot of changes, but we're just bringing guys back and guys are coming back off injury. Got Levante David at that will linebacker right outside. Quan Alexander as the middle linebacker, and then Kendall Beckwith at that left outside spot with the defensive line consisting of rookie Brian Burns starting. Good value in the third round. Vita Vea, Gerald McCoy hopefully is back, and then Jason Pierre-Paul. It is a pretty good new-look team. Not sure how they would compete in the NFC South. I think a lot of that is dependent on coaching. We have assembled the roster. They have the pieces in place. It's all about competing with some of these really, really talented teams in the NFC South, like the Saints. That's kind of it. it the Panthers are wishy-washy. They might not even have Cam Newton this next year. Never know about the Falcons. They're a team with all the potential in the world that just does not live up to it. At least they didn't this year. Injuries were a uh, big concern and a big reason, a big part in that. But we'll have to see. Can this team compete in the NFC South? You'll have to let me know down in the comments section below. But thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you in the next one. Take it easy.